for your information, Brother, Brother Hart had been in rehab, and then he uh, had to be taken back to the hospital. And now he's been moved to Willimantic because they need uh, better doctors, um, possible kidney failure, along with the heart failure. So we need to pray that God just do a miracle in his life. Let's do that right now. God, we come to you asking that you would move on Brother Hart, that you would touch him right now, and you would give wisdom to doctors, that you would heal his body, that you would give him relief, that you would touch his lungs, that you would give him your presence. Let him feel your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. We don't know all that God's doing there, but as I've talked with him several times, he said with all the issues he's had, he hasn't had a lot of pain, and they're kind of wondering why he hasn't had more pain. So I don't know why God does what he does or doesn't do what he does, but I know prayer works, so we're just going to keep praying and speaking to that, right? Today, I want to caution you to beware of the creep. Uh, All of you can relate to the problem of accumulation. We now have Kmart shutting down and becoming storage centers because we have so much accumulation. Basements get full. Sheds get to where you can't open them up. Uh, I'll talk to some of you. What's the word for 80 and 70-year-olds? Some of you older ones, you'll, you'll recognize... You'll recognize the term Fibber McGee's Closet. Fibber McGee was an old radio show. uh, And when he opened the closet, everything fell out on top of him because it was so much accumulation. Our attics are accumulated. Our our closets get accumulated. And as most of you know, the sooner and more often you straighten them, the easier that's fixed. The longer you wait, the worse it gets. And the same is true spiritually. And that, that's why we have different ways to keep our lives uncluttered. Uh, for example, I've, I've mentioned before how we've tried to here provide three things for you. Um, obviously, the first is you provide for yourself. But your own personal devotions is a very important part of keeping your life uncluttered. Attending church is a very important part. Sometimes God can do in church what he can't do in your personal devotions because you have a blind spot or because there's not the the amount of faith and the flow, and somebody else needs to speak into your life. And then there's prayer and care groups, and our our Bible studies, that's where you have a small group where there's other people that you're being honest with and praying with, and there's each of those, it's kind of like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They all have their place. They all have a different thing that they're doing in your life, but it's a little at a time. So you can look at it like this too. Reading the Word of God and praying to God is almost like food and water to our bodies. So to help us survive and thrive, God gives everybody hungers. Everyone say hunger. Hunger. So He gives you drives and hungers. And we're going to look at that body, soul, and spirit. But how we choose to satisfy those hungers is everything. So I have a hunger. If I don't identify it, and properly solve that by fulfilling it like it's supposed to be so I can be healthy, I will misidentify it or try to satisfy it with something besides what it's supposed to be satisfied with, and then I get trouble. And that can, that can do damage to my body. It can do damage to my mental health. It can do damage to my emotional health. It can even open me up to spiritual problems. So beware of the creep. This is what Jesus said. On the last day, the climax of the festival, John 7, Jesus stood, shouted to the crowds, Anyone who's thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. When he said living waters, he was speaking of the Spirit, who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. Jesus had to do what he did, and then, uh, then he ascended into heaven, so he was no longer bound by that body, so he could come live in us. We, we ask Jesus into our hearts, right? Same thing, when he fills us with his spirit, same thing. It's the Holy Spirit, God, coming and living inside of us. And that's, he, he said, anybody who's thirsty can drink of that. And so the idea is, He makes us thirsty, so we'll drink of Him, and we drink of Him, then we're satisfied. It's that easy. But if we're drinking of something else, 
Like if you're thirsty and need water and you're drinking vodka, you got problems, right? And, and you might be trying to quench your thirst, but you're not, it's not working. It's causing other problems. If I'm thirsty for God and I seek uh, idolatry or I, I seek spirituality or I seek intellectualism, there's a lot of things I can seek to fill that void. If I don't fill it with God, I have problems. This is a promise. Come and drink. The key is I have to hunger for the right things. The key is I have to satisfy my hunger appropriately. I just preached my whole sermon there, so if any of you need to go to sleep, you're welcome to do that. <laughs> then Matthew chapter 5, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. God gives everyone a hunger for righteousness. If they'll let God, he'll fill that. So there's a lot of people out there just dissatisfied in life. They're just hungry. There's a lot of people in church. They're, they're in the right place. They're in the right vicinity. They're in the kitchen. They're just eating junk food. And God says, I have a way to satisfy. But you need to recognize when you have a hunger, recognize that's a good thing. If you didn't have hunger, you wouldn't eat. If you didn't eat, you'd die. So God gives your body hunger to help you stay alive. Let's pray for God's wisdom here. Lord, I pray that you would give us wisdom. I pray that you would help each one of us as we hunger after you to understand how to satisfy that hunger. You promised, Lord, that we'd be filled. You promised that we could come and our, our thirst would be quenched. I pray you'd help us to understand this in very practical ways. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This is lesson number six in our series, Holy, Holy, Holy. And we're kind of going back to the, the first holy H-O-L-E-Y, because everyone in this room, everyone in the world has what's been called a God-shaped hole. Everybody in the world was made to worship God, to love God, to fellowship with God. What we just did here a few minutes ago, where we worshiped God, some people don't understand it, some people have never done what we just did, some people may be among people who are worshiping but don't know how to open up their heart to it and so they don't know how sweet it is. They don't know how satisfying it is. They don't know how great it is just to sit in God's presence and let Him love us. It's so satisfying. This isn't a new concept and it's really credited to the 17th century French philosopher Blaise Pascal. Uh, he, he, wrote, he was writing a book in 1662 when he died and about eight years later, some people came along and they, they took his writings and they published it in a book called Pensies. And this is a quote from that book. What else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but that there was once in man a true happiness of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace. This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there the help he cannot find in those that are. Though none can help, since the, this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object, in other words, by God himself. Everybody has a hunger for God. And then earlier than that, in about 400 A.D., St. Augustine of Hippo wrote, You've made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Everyone in the world, because of God's grace, is born with a hole in their heart, a, a place for God. Everyone longs for Him. That's why it doesn't matter what society or what period of time you look at in history, every group of people has some kind of religion. There's some kind of God everywhere. And, and a lot of them turn out to be bad gods, gods of this world, satanic influences, demons that whole nations worship. They're trying to fill a void, so they throw their babies to alligators. They, they walk on glass. They, they do all kinds of good works. They blow themselves up. They're all looking. They're trying to satisfy this, this deep, deep hunger. Uh, and then there's other hungers that God put in you that are supposed to be in you, like you're supposed to want to be loved. You're supposed to want to be approved by others. 
You're supposed to want to have this deep hunger in your, your, the deepest part of you to be happy. You're supposed to have a hunger to have purpose and meaning in life. You're supposed to have this hunger to be a part of something bigger than you. And all of those hungers God gave us so we could then look for good, positive, biblical, godly ways to fill that hunger so we could be healthy individuals. Have a healthy mind, have a healthy heart, have a healthy body. Because we hunger and, and then we eat the right stuff. The hunger that God gives us is sometimes something we don't understand. Has anyone ever just, you, you get up, you're going through your day, and it's just like, I don't know what I want, I just, I want something. It's just something, I, I, I just, something's not right. I, I'm hungry, I don't know what I'm hungry for, but I'm hungry for something. We can learn about body, soul, and spirit by starting with the body. When you have a physical hunger in your body, it's, it's supposed to be so you'll go find something healthy to fill that hunger with, right? It's pretty simple. So let's, let's play this out in just a few minutes, okay? If I'm hungry and I um, am lazy, am I going to eat healthy? No. I'm going to have some little Twinkie or I'm going to have chips or I'm going to have Fritos. Or so, I'm not saying you should never eat those things, but if I'm hungry, I'll just go eat. Now, how many of you can attest to, to this? Sometimes when we're hungry and we eat, we're not really physically hungry. We eat because we're lonely. We eat because we're afraid. We eat because we're bored. We eat because of all kinds of things. And when you do that, beware of the creep. Because before long, you're eating for every reason, and you're eating all the wrong things, and your physical body can only take so much. If every time you're lonely, you eat. If every time you're afraid, you eat. If every time you uh, are, 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 are just bored, you eat, 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 eat. Then before long, you're bored with healthy food, and then it's more and more Twinkies and more and more ice cream. And then before long, you're getting health issues. Your body has too much sugar or you're tired all of the time. And it's like, wait, I have hunger and I'm just filling my hunger, aren't I? Isn't, isn't that good? No, it's not good enough just to eat whatever's in sight. You've got to figure out what's healthy to eat. So that's true body. That's true of mind. That's true of emotions. That's true of spirit. And it's hard to de determine sometimes what's hungry. Is that my body that's hungry or is that my mind that's hungry? And that's why we have scales like what's the optimum uh, body fat or the optimum weight and height and stuff like that. That's to kind of help us to see if I'm eating too much and my body's getting unhealthy, uh, I should notice that and do something about what I'm eating. Because... If I don't, it doesn't hurt anybody else. It hurts me. So just because you're hungry doesn't mean you're supposed to eat. Just because you feel like eating doesn't mean you're supposed to eat. That might mean you have to wean yourself of junk food. Anybody ever been through that? You know why fasting is such a terrible, horrible thing? It's because so often we're not eating healthy. And so the caffeine is not there. And so our body starts reacting to that, proving that we're probably taking in too much caffeine if we start shaking when we don't have it. We, we can tiss, tiss the people who deal with drugs and alcohol or things that you don't deal with. But if, if, you're, if you're addicted to energy drinks, if you're addicted to caffeine, if you're addicted to chocolate, if anything like that it has to keep you going, you're probably not being healthy. I'm not saying it's a heaven or hell issue. I'm just saying you're probably not being healthy. So those holes that God made in us, that hunger that God put in us, he put in us so we could find healthy ways to fill that thing. But, but we, most of us have grown up in a society that's a little dysfunctional. I, th I think 
uh, I'm not being judgmental. I think most people would say it's not normal to have mass shootings. It's not really healthy for people to be uh, afraid to go to New York City. It's really not healthy if you can't ride the subway anymore. We have an unhealthy, dysfunctional society because people, they've thought or they've been taught or they've learned from other people, when you have an urge, go for it. So, you know, she looks like she ought to be kissed, just go kiss her. doesn't matter if she's a perfect stranger. Where do we learn that? Well, TV is a good place. And they can get away with it there, right? And so uh, people are, are, are looked up to who, who are movie stars who do a lot of things. Uh, we dealt with a guy a few years ago who used to have a problem taking his clothes off in public. And so he got put in jail. Now, if he had gone to Hollywood and got a job, he would got a lot of money for it. He could have taken it off before billions of people. But because he was doing it in a neighborhood... He got thrown in jail. Well, I think he should have been dealt with. He shouldn't do that, but neither should they be taking their clothes off in front of millions of people. So we teach our kids, if you're hungry, if you want to be approved, well, dress yourself up. Paint yourself up. Make yourself look attractive. And so thousands and thousands of images come before them, and everybody who's got it together, and everybody who's got the good life, is half naked or, or, or sleeping around with everybody and their dog or got some weird hairdo or some, some, something they're doing with their body. And, and so they're, that, that hunger to be approved, they're doing all these unhealthy things and nobody uh, anymore, you're a bigot if you help, try to even help your kids make some good choices. And so we have an unhealthy society that propagates unhealthy ways of filling those hungers. So if I want to be approved and I, I, I want to be a part of something and I, my family is not approving me and my, my school is not approving me, then I'll go to a gang because they love me. They accept me. I'm part of something. They think I'm somebody. They give me respect. And so I take a, a, an unhealthy junk food and I, I feel that need to be approved with an unhealthy relationship with the gang. And that's why I'll go kill somebody. It's because there's a hunger to be approved. It's not being met in the home. It's not being met in a church because they're not going to church. It's not being met anywhere. So they go to these junk places to get their help. So you got to eat healthy. And, and the enemy has an answer for every hunger. If you're hungry for spirituality, he's got the occult. He's got Ouija boards. He's got uh, fortune tellers. He's got tarot cards. He's got all kinds of things. You can go be spiritual. The problem is you're going you're gonna to fellowship with some real spiritual stuff. And you're going to spiritually be attacked and maybe even oppressed and maybe even taken over. That's how our spirit gets unhealthy. Or, or if I need to just be loved, he's, he's given, instead of healthy, good relationships, he's put lust in that place. Lust is the junk food that takes the place of love. And so we lust instead of love. And so there's pornography and there's all kinds of serial relationships and there's, and there's all kinds of sleeping around and all that kind of stuff. Junk, 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 junk. And it, it makes us unhealthy in our souls. Every time someone sleeps with somebody, the, the Bible says their souls are joined together and then they rip apart. So their innards are just ripped apart. Every time there's any kind of fornications, rip, 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 rip. And then we want wonder why we can't have good marriages. It's because our, our innards have been so messed up by all that fornication. And God comes along and says, don't do fornication. Just like mom comes along and says, don't drink ammonia. Don't eat the rat poison. Stay out of that cabinet. Don't ever take anything that's in that cabinet and eat it. And, and what, is, what does a two and a four year old do? Oh, mama doesn't want me to do that because that's fun. And, and they would rather try to get in that cabinet and get whatever they're not supposed to have than eat a steak dinner. That's human nature. you got to brighten up and stop going to the cabinet that you're not supposed to be in. There are things that are 
good in some respect that we can gorge on. You know, you can eat too much of a good thing. You could be eating nothing but perfectly balanced meals, seven a day, eight a day, nine a day, and before long, eating that good stuff makes you unhealthy. Right? Same is true in the mind, same is true in the emotions, same is true in the spirit. So I have to decide when is enough enough? Well, well, think about it physically. When is enough enough? Well, if you're like me, when I eat, it's a project. I'm going to attack that thing. I can't, I can't even slow down sometimes. It's like I, I got this thing to eat. That I got a project to do. I'm going to eat all this up. And if I'm not careful, uh, I've eaten my whole meal before it's even hit my stomach. <laughs> and so sometimes you feel like, I'm going to go for seconds. Because you're not feeling it yet. You don't need seconds. But you go for seconds. So uh, people always laugh at my wife and I because now when we go out to eat, we always share a meal. And we've found that one meal is usually enough for two people. If I were to eat a full meal every time I went out to eat, I would have, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm feeling convicted about my health sometimes. <laughs> I'd be much bigger than I am today. And it's not just about being fat or just, I'm not talking, it's about being healthy or not. Do I need that much? And if, if, if I feel hunger and I start eating and I'm not thinking about it, I'm waiting for this hunger to be filled, I may eat too much. Like Thanksgiving, and then it's like, oh, I shouldn't have done all that, right? The problem is, unless you're bulimic, which is an unhealthy thing, you're stuck with that. And if you do that often enough, your stomach gets bigger, and then you want more, and then you eat more, and then you want more, and then you eat more, and then you want more. Somebody's got to manage that, or you're going to have health problems. Same is true intellectually, same is true emotionally, same is true spiritually. Good things. For example, it's good for me to pray. I should talk to God. And there's nothing better than talking to God. But if I start praying and, and marking the minutes as if the more I pray, the better I am, and I want to feel good about myself, I can pray and pray and pray and pray. And after a while, I'm not really communicating with God. I'm racking up points. And so you know there are some people you've met probably that are so spiritual, they're always floating in the heavens, you know, always doing good things, but, but something's wrong. They're not healthy. They're, they're overdosing on a good thing. This is true of ministry. Ministry is a good thing. You need to, uh, everybody should be a minister of some kind. Everybody in this room should have somebody that they're trying to help. And so you should try to help people. But Sometimes you can, it feels good to help people. You have a hunger to be a part and to help somebody. So you're supposed to do that. It's supposed to be fulfilling. It's supposed to be a healthy thing. But if it's so satisfying that people need me, or if it's so satisfying that people look at me like, ooh, she can sing, or boy, he can preach, then before you know it, I'm unhealthily ministering, not for God. It's not a good God flowing through me. It's me feeling better and better about myself because now I did an album. Now I got in front of a thousand people. And now a lot of people are clapping when I get up and sing. Now I'll go on the internet and a lot of people will give me likes for my ministry. And what I'm doing is I'm overdosing. I am, I am satisfying a hunger with a good thing. But now I'm doing it for wrong reasons. And it's too much of a good thing. And, and Many times people will go from church to church to church looking for a position, looking for a ministry. Why? They're, they're not doing it for God. They're doing it for, they're trying to meet a need to be approved. They're trying to be important. And that's, it's not wrong to want to be important. It's just wrong who you are important for. Are you important for people or are you important for him? Because he's wanting to be the approver. He's wanting to be the one that makes you feel good about yourself. If you don't feel loved, he, he, there are other people that will love you and there are relationships. But everybody who's ever been married can tell you, your husband and your wife are not going to fill that void in you. 
as much as you think they are. That's only something that can be filled by God and shared with your spouse. If you look to your spouse to love you enough to fill that hole, you put too much pressure on your spouse, and then you start getting mad at them for not doing their job when it's not their job to make you happy. It's not their job to make you whole. If you're not married yet, and you have this imagination that one of these days you're going to get married and finally you're going to be whole, bunk. You're going to be whole in Jesus, and then he can add someone to your life, and that will be wonderful. But if you're looking for Mr. Wonderful or Mrs. Wonderful, it's not going to fill that void that's inside of you. That's an unhealthy idea. You just think that's going to make you feel good. You're walking through the mall. You have a hunger. You smell Cinnabon. That is not your answer. That will not make you whole. That will not make you healthy. But I'll tell you what, I fall into that temptation many times. It's really hard to pass by a Cinnabon. And really, most of the time, they smell better than they taste. God wants to be the one to fill those hungers. So when Paul visited Athens, Athens was an immoral city. I mentioned a few weeks ago how there was one lady that had 23 divorces and another guy had 21 divorces and they got married because people were just going from marriage to marriage to marriage to marriage trying to fill a hunger. And Paul comes along and he gives them some advice. He took the stand in an open space and, and he says this, it's plain to see that you Athenians take your religion seriously. When I arrived here the other day, I was fascinated with all the shrines I came across, and I found one inscribed to the God nobody knows. Would you say that? To the God nobody knows. A whole society hungry for something spiritual, hungry for God, but they didn't know him. I'm here to introduce you to this God so you can worship intelligently, know who you're dealing with. The God who made the world and everything in it, this master of the sky and land doesn't live in custom-made shrines or need the human race to run errands for him as if he could not take care of himself. He makes the creatures. The creatures don't make him. Starting from scratch, he made the creatures. Uh, he made the entire human race and made the earth hospitable with plenty of time and space for living so we could seek after God, not just grope around in the dark, but actually find him. He doesn't play hide and seek with us. He's not remote. He's near. We live and move in him. Can't get away from him. One of your poets said it well. We're the God created. Well, if we're the God created, it doesn't make a lot of sense to think we could hire a sculptor to chisel a God out of stone for us, does it? We have a hunger to worship God. We have a hunger for God's love. We have a hunger to love other people on God's behalf. It would be foolish for us to worship the people who lead worship. It would be foolish for us to worship the people who bring the word of God. It would be foolish for us to, to serve our church. Those are all just something to help us serve our God, love our God, and be empowered by our God. But mankind usually gravitates to what it can touch and feel and see. So we'll drive across the country to, to a worship band. And we'll go from conference to conference to conference trying to satisfy hunger when if we got real with God at home and started dealing with the deeper issues that are inside of us, we would have so much satisfaction and so much healing that we wouldn't have the hunger to run all over the place. Then if we went to a conference or something like that, it would just be frosting. It would just be extra stuff that God is adding. So we're not only born with that God-shaped hole, all those needs, but then life comes along and it reams us out a little bit more. And there's holes in each one of us in this room that come from trauma. What do I do when I'm stuck? What do I do when I'm hungry and I just don't know what to do about it? What do I do when I, I've tried everything and I just can't feel good about my life? Well, the old timer said it like this. You need to go pray through. Now, old-timers have been 
criticized for this. And sometimes people say, oh, they just make oversimplifying it. And I understand we can tend to oversimplify things. But I don't think you can really say that's oversimplifying. If, if praying through means I go and I get so real with God that everything's on the table, I bring everything out in the open, I get completely honest with Him, I'm willing to do whatever, I'm willing to repent, I'm willing to forgive, I, I just gut it out, I'm willing to let go of everything, I'm willing to receive God however He wants me to, I'm willing for Him to fill my hunger however, and, and if you've ever prayed through, you know you'll get to the place where you're finally done, done being angry, you're finally done done feeling like a victim you're finally done fighting with God and you just break through to this okay God whatever you want to do in my life and there's this flow of the Holy Ghost that comes and if you've ever learned how to open up and let God flow through you in tongues a lot of times praying through includes that there's just tongues that flow Paul said when I speak in tongues I edify myself and so I get over myself and I break through all my problems and I get over all my hurts and I, I, I get over all my hunger and I just have this session with God where he just overwhelms me and if you've ever broken through like that you, you'll identify with this feeling that it just feels like the world just got better everything got better why because I broke through something but if you've, if you've had trauma in your life, it gets complicated. It's like, again, go back to your body. There's, there's hunger, and there's fulfilling that hunger, and that's all normal. But let's suppose you had a problem with your esophagus. Let's suppose you have an ulcer in your stomach. Let's suppose you have a digestive disease of some kind. Well, when trauma like that comes, it, it complicates everything. Now I'm hungry, but I can't eat, or I'm hungry, but I can't, my system is not working like it should, so I have to, I have to somehow try to get the trauma fixed so my body can get back to doing what it's supposed to do. I'm, I'm setting this up for a good six weeks of talking about some, some serious stuff like demon possession, depression, stuff, big, big stuff. Um, this is prerequisite. You need to understand that sometimes if you were abused... If, if you grew up in a dysfunctional family, if you did something horrible that you, have, you can't get over, if there's some kind of trauma in your mind, if there's some kind of trauma in your emotions, if there's some kind of trauma in your spirit, then it complicates everything. So someone can get up and say, just let Jesus love you. Well, that's true. If we can let Jesus love you, that's all it would take. But if I feel unlovable... If there's a trauma that happened to me that makes me feel unlovable, then I don't even let God love me. And so God has to somehow get in there and fix that trauma. Sometimes I can't do that myself. Sometimes I need somebody else to operate on me. And that's where doctors and that's where counselors and that's where pastors come in. And that's what we'll get to in future lessons. But the bottom line is this. God himself is able to do it. He'll use people... He'll use situations, but you have to be game for, God, even the trauma you can take out of my life. I don't have to, I don't let, I don't let trauma tell me who I am. I am not the abused boy. I am not the boy who was a, a liar and, and will never be anything but a liar. I am not that dummy that can't spell. I'm, I will not receive that, that trauma will not identify me. I am a child of God. I am a blood bought, blood washed person. I am somebody that God loves and he's going to heal those things in me. He's going to help me to think straight about those things. He's going to help me to feel right about those things and he's going to meet those needs that are deep inside of me. The enemy's job is to accuse. The enemy's job is is to get you mostly mad at God, if he can. Let's use the illustration again, humanly speaking. If I, have, if I have a cyst on my lungs that's keeping me from breathing, someone needs to help me with that. But if my aunt went to a doctor that was a quack and died, and I hate doctors... Probably not going to go let a doctor take the cyst off my lung, right? So the person that can help me, I don't want to go to 
So in a way, I've limited how I can be helped. So if the, the accuser can come and blame God for things and get you mad at God, then you won't let God do what only God can do in your life. So God has to try to break through every way he can and help you to trust him all over again. Because he's the counselor, he's the comforter, he is the great physician. So what, what we've done for years around here is we have prayer groups. Why do we have prayer groups? It's because if we can teach people how to open up and really get honest with and open to God, he can solve so many things. He can take care of physical issues, he can take care of mental issues, he can take care of emotional issues, and he can take care of spiritual issues. If you and I could really connect with God and pray, although he may leave some things in our body or uh, some things unhealed in some ways, he, he has promised to heal some things like sin. He's promised to just wash it away and remember it no more. So, I'm talking to all of you who come to church every week. Beware of the creep. Because even Christians, before we know it, we've been eating healthy, and then we just have one Twinkie, and then two Twinkies, and then three Twinkies. And before long, we've moved away from healthy, praying through, letting God cleanse, having full relationship with him, letting him make us feel loved. And we just don't do that like we should. And before you know it, we start looking to people to love us. We start looking to events to make us happy. And we start looking to our job to make us feel fulfilled. Creep, 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 creep. And we say, beware the creep. Now, here's an example. America was founded on Christian principles. And we're seeing before our very eyes, our society has, has crept to where we don't even have some basic morals sometimes. For example, Scott Rasmussen, who is a, 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 a poll taker, he surveyed Americans and he found what he called the 1% elite. And he said he's been polling for a very long time and the last finding is the most terrifying poll result I've ever seen. He said he discovered that a startling number of people are okay with cheating on elections. The elite, these were people, he said, were, they made $150,000 or more, they lived in densely populated areas, and they had postgraduate disease, disease, yeah, degrees. Disease might be, <laughs> might be appropriate. And they were overwhelmingly liberal. They have had their minds filled with mindsets. They have been told this is the way to think. He asked them, suppose your favorite candidate loses a, a close election. However, people on the campaign know that they can win by cheating without being caught. Would you rather have a candidate win by cheating or lose by playing fair? Among all Americans, 7% of Americans said they want to cheat. That's not bad. But that number, when he went to the elite, rose to 35%. And then when he polled the elites who were very politically involved, that rose to 69%. So 69% of the people who are politicians think it's okay to cheat on elections. Where did that come from? We were, we were established as a democracy. We were established, voting was important. We didn't want a king running things. We didn't want the elite telling us what to do. The whole reason for the American experiment was so everybody could have a voice, and we've crept and crept and crept and crept until now we're being taught, especially in our Ivy Leagues, it's okay to cheat because those dummies down there who are voting don't know what they're doing. We know what we're doing, and we need to do what's best for them. The creep. Well, we do that as Christians if we're not careful. I need to take preventative measures so my body doesn't get unhealthy, so my brain doesn't get unhealthy, so my emotions don't get unhealthy, and so my spirit doesn't get unhealthy. And so, just like Adam and Eve were told, you can eat all that stuff, just don't eat that one thing. 
It's my job to stay away from some stuff. And that's how I stay healthy. So, if John Piper said, if you don't feel strong desires for the manifestation of the glory of God, it's not because you've drunk deeply and are satisfied. It's because you've nibbled so long at the table of the world, your soul is stuffed with small things, and there's no room for the great. God did not create you for this. If, if it's been a while since you just hungered for great revival, if, if it's been a while since you just hungered to go to church, if it's been a while since you just really look forward to your devotion time, you're probably nibbling on a bunch of junk food and you're not even feeling hunger. And as, as soon as you feel hunger, instead of going to prayer, instead of going in fellowship, and instead of letting God meet those needs, you do something like, read a good book or watch a movie or call a friend or whatever. Not all bad things, but if you're taking those things instead of your time with God, you nibble and nibble and nibble, and before you know it, you don't even want to eat. It's dinner time, a great healthy meal. You've been snacking all day. You're not even hungry. Can you relate to that? So the biblical approach for healing and wholesomeness is to seek God and His love. And then find ways to let God love through you. That's what makes a healthy person. Dear friends, since God loved us, John said, since he loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. So I want to read an article just before we close. I'd like my wife to come that I, I wrote nine years ago. Some of you may remember it. He grew up normal. His favorite foods were pizza, hamburger, and chili. Then one day, his four-year-old friend changed his life forever. It was nearly supper time. They'd been playing hard. Their stomachs were growling and churning, begging to be satisfied. Dinner seemed far away, and his friend asked an intriguing question. Have you ever eaten rocks? Well, partly out of curiosity and partly because of silliness, he scooped up a handful of smooth pea-sized playground rocks, marched to the drinking fountain, and began tossing the rocks in his mouth and washing them down with long swigs of water. The effect was immediate and satisfying. No more churning, growling. This new diet settled heavily in his stomach, reassuring it that all was well. In one stroke of genius, he had discovered a food source that was free, required no baking or condiments, eliminated the need for chewing, and seemed to satisfy those pesky feelings of hunger so much more effectively than the dreaded vegetables his mother was forever plotting to force into his life. He determined then and there that he had discovered something his old fogey parents were too bigoted and closed-minded to embrace. And that from that day forward, he would feast in the playground and slip his mother's concoctions to the dog. Now, if that story were true, you can imagine the painful or possibly lethal ramifications. In the physical world, such foolishness is easily spotted and the effects force the necessary corrections. However, emotional and spiritual hunger are much trickier. People can make very bad choices when they try to find affection or meaning in life. And there are so many hucksters looking to swindle the unsuspecting. For example, a person who hungers for affection might latch on to someone who gives them a little attention, but whose selfish motives eventually bring them more harm than good. Instead of finding a healthy relationship or true love, they settle for codependency, a shallow physical relationship, or worse, they eat rocks. The ramifications are painful and destructive. Just as the four-year-old boy did not understand a parent's lecture about eating rocks, our society seems intolerant of those who warn against unhealthy choices made by people seeking to satisfy spiritual and emotional hungers. But in hopes that one or two people may benefit, let me plain, be plain about some of those unhealthy options. Hunger for love satisfied by sex outside of marriage rocks. Hunger for peace 
satisfied by drugs or alcohol, rocks. Hunger for spiritually, being spiritually satisfied by anything other than a relationship with Jesus, rocks. Hunger for approval, satisfied by pleasing people, rocks. It doesn't really matter how many books are written, how many movies are produced that celebrate the great satisfaction there is in eating rocks. It doesn't matter how many professors shame the general public for being closed-minded and misjudging rock eaters. It wouldn't matter if Congress passed laws making rock eating legal. Eating rocks is still a very bad idea. God created physical hunger. It ensures our survival. Life teach, will teach us the best items for satisfying that hunger. God also created us to hunger for love and purpose. The hunger is most perfectly satisfied in a healthy relationship with God and others. He gave us prayer and church and family to satisfy our hunger for fellowship. He promised to fill people with the Spirit so they would have inner strength to deal with life. He told us that if we would lose our lives in Him, we would discover abundant life. Everything else is rocks. Would you stand? i like us, in closing, I'm going to say a few things as you stand, and then we're going to be seated again instead of having altar time. And i like us just to practice chewing our food slowly, hungering after God, opening our heart to God. You can sit in a room full of angels and not have a spiritual experience. You can sit in the throne room of God and not be loved by God. You have to be the one to hunger and then decide to be satisfied by God and only God. So here are some parameters for hunger I want to mention before you're seated and do this. When I'm hungry, when I'm feeling something, I need something, I need to remember, first of all, I don't save. So if, if I'm if I'm wanting my, my, peop, my people to be saved and I'm hungering for that, I have to remind myself, I need to hunger for that. I need to pray for that. But I cannot carry them. I'm not their savior. That's just a parameter. It's like if I'm hungry for food, I, just, I know I don't eat rocks. That's just not a, that's not a, that's out of parameters. I have to know that I, I cannot heal. So I hunger I hunger for God to heal me, but I can't heal me, so all I can do is hunger for Him and then let Him heal if He wants to heal. I, I can't make decisions for other people, so I might want my kids to do the right things. I might hunger for that, but if I hunger for it too much, I then try to control them. The parameter is I can't make them do anything. All I can do is pray for them. I'm not responsible to do anything but obey God. I'm not responsible for the results. Right now, I just preach to all of you. I've done this for 20, well, for 40 years I've ministered to people. It's not my job to get results. I just put it out there. Sometimes people receive it, sometimes they don't. There's been times where I've hungered for people to receive it, and I've then beat myself up because I, I noticed that they didn't receive it and I took that on myself and, and then that complicates things because that's not that's outside the parameters I'm just supposed to love God and want to do things for God and minister to people and I have to let that be enough I ate my dinner I still feel a little hungry but I'm just going to wait this is enough I don't have to go to junk food I don't have to eat a second helping I, I did my part I have to tell my brain it's not my responsibility to save them it's not my responsibility to heal them All, I, I can be satisfied just knowing I did what I'm supposed to do the Bible says I'm not supposed to worry I'm just supposed to pray so if I'm worried about something I feel, if I feel a hunger for something to be done I need to pray but then I need to believe in prayer so much that I can stop worrying I shouldn't fear. I should trust. If I feel fear, if that's a hole in me, I, I want something to take the fear away. I, I don't get fear taken away by me doing something. I just trust him. I trust him. I trust him. And I trust him until I stop worrying about it and I, 
I, I let his perfect love cast out that fear. I can't control the world with power or money or anything else. So if, if I feel the need to be important, I need to understand that is supposed to be there so I will try to be important to God and then I will let his love for me meet that need in my life. How many of you watched as the richest and famous, the most famous among us, some of the, the best entertainers in, in the world have committed suicide or OD'd. Why? Because it, it looks like if, if, I got, if I got on stage and everybody clapped for me, if a thousand people clapped for me, it would meet my need. Those people are being clapped for by thousands and millions of people around the earth. They, they have millions of followers on their, their social media. They got millions that they have so much money that they got so much money they can buy love but it doesn't work. doesn't matter how famous you get. Whatever you think, if you're thinking, if I just had that ministry, no. Nah. If I just had that lover, no. If I just had that perfect body, no. God is your answer. And you have to get it in your head first. You have to be willing for God to be your answer. If, if you're not willing for God to be your answer, you will, you will go after idolatry. You'll, it might be a good thing. It might be uh, traveling around the world to NASCAR. People will put millions of dollars into these kind of things. They'll, they'll, they'll give up all their vacations, and they'll go places for doll clubs. They'll go all over the country for uh, uh, gaming. They'll go, oh, what are they doing? They're trying to satisfy some longing, and it might be through a hobby. It might be through an addiction. It might be through a, a series of relationships, but none of them are going to be able to fill that hole unless they find God. It's only God. And then some of those things can be added as enjoyable things to do in our lives. So some of you, God wants to heal. He tells us, again, I'll read it from a different translation, blessed and fortunate and happy and spiritually prosperous in that state in which the born-again child of God enjoys his favor and salvation are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, uprightness, right standing with God, for they shall be completely satisfied. So if I'm, if I'm a junk food addict, I have to understand and take charge of my body. And my body's always craving. Cravings are hardly ever healthy. Usually if you crave something, I know, I know there's the pregnant woman who craves ice cream or whatever. That's kind of a different thing that's happening there. But if, if, even that is usually not healthy. You know, a half gallon of ice cream when you're pregnant is not necessarily good for the pregnancy. If you're, if you're craving something, you should probably say, no, something's trying to hijack my life. I, it's probably not what I ought to do. If I'm craving something, I need to judge myself. Is it a bowl full of rocks or is this something that would be good for me to eat? So as you're seated again, I've asked my wife just to lead us in a couple of songs. And you do this all the time. You may not even realize how much it helps you, what you're doing. But when you come and you sing, a lot of times you'll open your, your spirit and your heart. And sometimes you'll even be able to put your mind at rest for long enough just to let God minister to you. It's not, not like we're singing just to get, but when we come into his presence and love him, it it makes us healthy. And I'm trying to help some of you, if, if you have an addiction of some kind, a private sin that's just driving you crazy, there might be some things to do to try to deal with that. And at times, we might need to find the root cause of that. But bottom line is, if you could be satisfied by God, it wouldn't even be an issue anymore. If, if you feel like you want to be loved and so you're on social media looking for love can't tell you how many people are getting murdered through those kind of connections today it's not, it's not I'm not saying you never run into anybody online I'm just saying that 
it's not a very safe place. If you're going to bars looking for someone to love you, you're, you're going to places where people are not at their best and they're, 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 it's a dangerous combination. I'm not saying they're bad people. I'm just saying they're not thinking straight right now. The two people not thinking straight looking for love collide in the night and then there's a baby and we got all kinds of problems, all kinds of complications. But if, if I'm looking for love and I, I feel like going to get a drink, I feel like just getting physically buzzed and instead I, I make myself go and I get on my knees or I, I get in a chair and I sing a song or I put on worship music and I start loving God. Before you know it, whatever it was that I was feeling the need for is not even there anymore. Now now I've eaten a, a good healthy dinner. I don't even want Twinkies anymore. My, I'm full. I'm satisfied. I'm feeling God's love. I don't need somebody else's love. I don't need somebody else to, to hug me or take me to bed. I, I just got fulfilled by my relationship with God and and if God adds those other things to me through legal means scriptural means well great I, I love my wife she she's everything to me but she's not my God she cannot fill my greatest needs but if my greatest needs are filled I'm such a better husband and I can have such a better marriage so what you do in your morning devotions and what you do at prayer group and what you do in services like this is so important because they're healthy meals that meet needs. And then throughout the week, you don't even have the hunger for those things because you've been in the presence of God and you felt his love and you felt his presence. So we're going to practice that right now. I'm, I'm done talking. I'd like my wife just to lead a few songs. And I, I'd like for you just to do what you want, sing, pray, kneel, do whatever you want. But let's just see if God won't meet our needs for a few minutes before we leave. Would you do that?